part of 13, almost 14 years now. And today we're going to talk about strategies for making fast, accurate CFD design decisions with TechBot 360EX. Uh, TechBot 360EX we'll talk about here in a minute. So let me quickly walk you through the agenda. This morning we're going to to have two sections. The first section is going to be a brief introduction to TechBot 360 as an application. Uh, we'll go through a tutorial. And the intent of this tutorial is to give you an idea of the overall usability of the product and also highlight those things that are different so that if you're a current TechBot user or new to the product, this would give you some context on how you might leverage some of the existing capabilities. Uh, then we'll talk about leveraging heterogeneous results. And we'll talk about comparing results. In that context, we will uh, be doing simple comparative analysis. After we uh, go through that section, we'll go into a more advanced analysis, and we'll talk about how one can leverage pages. Pages is a, a new set of functionality. We'll talk about quantitative comparing results. We'll look at how one can record macros and how you can leverage common macros and finally, we'll talk about how you can build reports and uh, show you how one can actually use layouts to build a report and automate that process. So lots to cover this morning, but we should have plenty of time. I know that there were a few folks uh, that had asked for the recording last time, and uh, so this is recorded, and so you'll have an opportunity. So for those who are new to TechBot 360 EX, it is uh, the most significant upgrade that we've done as a company in the last 15 years. We rebuilt it from the ground up with uh, QT and TechBot SDK, which is our own internal engine. Our design goals for the product are improved desktop performance on large data, and I'll show you some data uh, on where we are with that, as well as a new interface uh, for Mac and Linux users. I know that uh, Mac users in particular have been uh, really after us to move to something that's a little more native Mac. And so that was one of our goals. What's new in the product? Well, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of features. I don't need to go into each one of these per se, but I would like to point out one in particular, which is our new Sizzle technology. Um, I will discuss Sizzle technology during the presentation and even show you how you can leverage that technology to ultimately improve uh, the speed at which you can do analysis. And, and at the end of the day, that's kind of where we want to focus our energies. Ultimately, you're looking at complex high fidelity simulation. And, and unfortunately, over the last few years, the data has become so large and so complex, it's not always easy to go through and do the analysis. In fact, um, I've talked to quite a few engineers over the last several months who have kind of moved almost exclusively to batch, and I ask, well, why, why do you do that? And we said, well, you know, the data is so big when I load it in, it's just painful. So I just do batch extraction and I'll look at a small subset of the data, which is a, a, certainly a strategy. What we're finding, though, is that when you do that, you better guess right. And if you're doing analysis on a new system, you may not know exactly where you need to look. So our technology allows you to look but do it as if it was a small data set. And I'll show you how that works here in a second. Um, I talked about the new UI pages, uh, the new macro panel, and I'm going to go through these in detail. So our strategy is based on our understanding of how computations are processed. So the data files typically are stored online. There are a lot of research being done on in situ visualization, which again is another extraction strategy. Uh, certainly has merit, although there are some disadvantages to to doing the in situ visualization. Again, you have to guess right. If you don't find the, the key feature, you could actually end up having to rerun the simulation, which may or may not be an issue. So we're finding that uh, data read speeds are doubling about every 36 months, which is a 26% annual rate of speed improvement. Uh, which compared to disk capacity, which is uh, going up by uh, every 12 months. Now, what's really interesting is there's been a lot of research into solid state drive technology. Solid state drives seem to work very well for certain applications, but for reading large uh, continuous files, they aren't much faster. And I actually have a solid state drive on my workstation, which 
I've done some testing and I have a very fast solid state drive and versus the old fashioned high speed spindle drive and I'm not seeing huge improvements. So this still is an issue that they're trying to work on but I don't think they have a solution today. Uh, bandwidth that is getting it from the, where the file resides to uh, the CPU GPU, that's doubling every about 16 months. And if you look at CPU GPU performance, it's still following Moore's law. So in a way, uh, our focus has been primarily around loading off the disk. So Sizzle technology is really a combination of data management uh, algorithms. We do some requirement predictors and indexing. Uh, it's exhaustively parallel on a shared memory machine. And we've done a fair amount of code optimization to take advantage of this new file format. We've seen some rather significant improvements in analysis times. And this is uh, not just loading the, the data and saying, oh, look, there's an image. This is loading the data, extracting the slice. The things that people do day in and day out, um, we've seen 9.6 to 62.4, more or less, uh, speed ups with that data. And, and that's over a, a large swath of data files. And I'll show you that here in a second. Uh, the other more interesting thing is we've been able to reduce the memory requirements very significantly uh, between 84 and 92 percent. So if that, uh, to put that in context, if it used to take you 100 gigabytes of data to load a file, or 100 gigabytes of RAM for me to load a file, you could now load that file with 8 gigs of RAM. So pretty significant decrease in memory requirements. There's also some compression, which is about 60 percent. So this is the Processing pipeline, these are examples. I'm actually going to walk through a few of these examples today. Um, but you can see that ranging from about 1 million to about 2 billion cells. Uh, we actually looked at data ranging from about 216,000 to 416 million on my machine. Um, it's hard to get a speed up for this particular data file as a 2 billion cell model unfortunately cannot be loaded in the old format on my machine. I just don't have enough uh, memory. Uh, they vary a little bit, but on average, we're talking about a, about a 9.6 uh, times speed up. So that's almost an order of magnitude faster for common CFD workflows. From a memory reduction standpoint, same set of data. You can see the blue line is TechBot 360 2013 R1. And uh, the following ones here are 360EX using a PLT file. And you can see that even uh, 360EX without using Sizzle technology is using about half the memory that our old product was using. And if you look at the 400 million cell model, uh, I guess in this case it's using quite close to, I think, 4 gigs of RAM, which is pretty amazing. Now, why we think this is important is if you think about a typical um, design study where you may look at high fidelity simulation over a large section of the uh, operating conditions, and in that case you may have a 1,000 design points, or maybe 100 design points, depending on your computational resources. Based on this technology, using the new Sizzle technology, you would be able to process, uh, in this case, it's less than one gigabyte. So you could run nominally 8 to 16 simultaneous tech plots to actually process that data in parallel uh, for overall like image creation and extraction or analysis. So that's a pretty significant decrease in memory. Other things to be aware of, the interface has been updated. It's now using QT technology. For those people in development, they're probably familiar with it. What you basically get in that context is the ability to have dockable sidebars as well as dockable menus. And where we're going with this technology, you'll have more customization. In the current implementation, it's uh, not customizable yet, but uh, we have plans to make it more customizable in the next couple of releases. Other things that we've moved towards is more of a context-based style implementation. So if one needs to change style on an object, one can do that with a right click. The idea is that this would allow you to very quickly get to advanced options, uh, change curve settings, extract data. And we'll go through this in detail in the first part of this, the, the demonstration. Slicing has been updated as well. We now have arbitrary slicing. And you can do an extraction, which we will do uh, right on screen with a single click. So pretty. Uh, nice improvement there. And uh, we have pages. We'll go through this in the second half of uh, the presentation today where we'll talk about how you can create reports. 
and we'll go through and you can see that we can have one or more data sets in a particular frame. You can have one or more data sets in a particular page and you could have up to 32,000 pages. Um, I wouldn't recommend it just because that would be hard to handle, but the more like slides and so you can create reports for presentation. We also added the macro panel and we're going to go through some examples of how you can leverage the macro panel uh, to go out and look at a corporate macros that you can apply uh, to this type of analysis. So the other thing about our macros, if you haven't used them, you know, oftentimes I know that most engineers have some background in programming and certainly scripting is uh, not difficult. However, uh, if you can read a script, it can be an easier thing to customize to your specific need. And so TechBot macros, as I'll show you, are, are very readable. So you can kind of get a sense of what's going on by looking at the macro and it's not um, like you can't well wonder what that command does, it's going to be pretty obvious. Uh, and those macros can be accessed very quickly via the macro panel, and I'll show you how to use that. So we're going to talk about this subzone loading a little bit just early on, as that's one way to accelerate learning, is to be able to operate very quickly on large data sets. And I think I went through this in detail. How it works is uh, it is kind of interesting that this particular orthogonal bisection strategy has been around for some time. This is a decomposition of the domain uh, akin to what you might do if you break up your domain for computation, although uh, we do a slightly different breakup. And the idea is that we actually index each one of these, these subdomains, subzones, so to speak, and we understand what the max and mins are for all the variables in that subdomain. What that allows us to do is that, as you can see, there's a contour line here. What effectively happens is that we can index, because it's well indexed and we can search through the tree very quickly, we can load only those cells and necessary where this particular line uh, goes through, or that value goes through those cells. So in this case, you're looking about 5 sixteenths of the data. And that's basically how it works. We have a number of white papers. Uh, Scott Emily, who is our CTO, has published three papers on the subject and presented those at uh, AIAA shows. So you're more than welcome to uh, take a look at that as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the data and I'm going to go out to the desktop here and uh, I'll make sure that we can see what's going on here and I'll, I'll wait for it to update. So one thing that I'll try to do is go slow enough for you to kind of get a sense of what we're doing. What I'm showing you here is actually TechBlock three or TechBlock Core. I want to start with TechBlock Chorus as it allows us to get to the data of interest. And we're going to take a look at, this is a typical performance run that we look at at TechBlock. And we're looking at TechBlock 360 versus uh, TechBlock 360 EX and TechBlock 360 EX using Sizzle. And uh, we'll run through a set of cases, as I said, that range from about uh, 100,000 cells, in this case, to about 416 million cells. So pretty large swath of data. And we'll look at the overall speed up. So the red line here is the baseline. That is our current technology. The speed ups are in times faster. So you know, this is about five times faster. And you can see this is 360EX with just typical data. And you can see that it ranges from about five times faster to about eight times faster. And this green line represents data in the sizzle format. Now you can see there's at least one here where it's a little slower. This particular example actually is slowed down by graphics rendering. So on my machine, I run out of, of graphics memory to, to run this. So with a beefier uh, graphics card, this would look probably more linear. But the idea is that you can see that performance goes up as a function of the data size. And so for the, even for the smaller data, uh, say data below, say 40 million, which is you know pretty typical for where people are doing kind of day-to-day -day work. Um, you can see that for the most part, uh, sizzle is faster, and you know again ranging in the three to four times faster uh, than just typical PLT data. And again, there are some anomalies, and that has to do with some limitations uh, that will be removed in the second release. Okay, well what I wanted to do is actually take a look at a couple of examples, and we're going to walk through how to look at this data in TechBlot 360. So let's start by looking at some data, say, in the uh, 20 million size. And so if I uh, go over here, I can
quickly look at these data, view the images, and I can see kind of what data is being accessed. But we're, we're actually going to look at a couple of simple examples, and we'll walk through those. But I just wanted to show you this quickly. This is how we do our tests. And let's go to the desktop, and we'll fire up 360 EX. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through this example slow enough so that perhaps uh, those people new to TechBot 360 will be able to understand kind of where I'm going with this. Um, and I'm also going to do it in such a way that you can kind of get a sense of how to operate and get to do some of the workflows. And again, the idea of this, this webinar is to help you understand what are those key things. And the first key thing, of course, is loading big data quickly. So I'm going to open up a data file here, which is a 93 million cell transport airplane. And we'll start with that case. And so let me show you where that data are. And I put them all in a simple directory. So we'll scroll on down here to the transport airplane. And uh, although I could load this in, in TechPlot PLT format, to give you an idea of the difference in speed ups, on this machine, if I were to write or read that data in, it takes about 108 seconds to load. That is the time to get the first image. But let's go ahead and take this sizzle file. And we're going to go ahead and load that. So again, it's about 108. Uh, seconds to load. Oops. Go ahead and uh, load a data file. Um, okay, so I'll go ahead and grab the S the sizzle file. Uh, those directory. I'll put it up here. And uh, let's see here. Okay, so there's the transport. We'll go ahead and open that. Okay, so again, it takes about 109 seconds to open that up with a PLT format. You can see it takes almost no time to open it up. Now, you can see that we identified the surfaces, and we've uh, made those surfaces opaque. Uh, I'm going to quickly deactivate them so that I can get to the actual model. So I can select a zone just by right-clicking on it and deactivate that zone. So. And I'm not going to deactivate all of these, but let's just get rid of some of the outside zones. These are zones that don't particularly provide value uh, to my analysis. And you can see there's the transport airplane down below. Let's see, I could have just uh, done this via the zone style dialog by just double clicking. Here's the zone style dialog. If you chose to, uh, one could actually highlight this and say, oh, I don't need to show that zone either. Um, in this case, you can see that the majority of the zones have effectively names which aren't easy to uh, understand. So that's a, an issue that we're trying to address. You know, if you don't know what your zones are called, if you bring in a solution, you really don't know what each zone is called, it's sometimes easier to just interact with the screen. So here is uh, the, the model of interest. And uh, this model is actually, although it looks pretty cool. It actually is, is not a real airplane. And uh, what I want to do, and what is pretty typical of most analysis, is I actually want to go in. I want to take a slice on this wing at a number of stations, and then uh, look at the pressure coefficient on those slices, or at least look at the pressure on those slices as a function of uh, percent along the actual wing. So let's uh, start by dropping in a slice. So I'm going to turn on the slice. And it looks like we need a slice in the y direction. You can see that the slice shows up very quickly. Again, this is due to the sizzle technology. The typical slice to, to load on this case was, I guess, 100 plus 9. So it's in about 118 seconds or so uh, to create this first slice using um, non-sizzle data. So I'll move this into the Y direction. I can do that by opening up the slice detail dialog, move this into the Y position, and we'll go ahead and move it here on the wing. So in this case, though, I'm not as interested in the volume per se. I actually want to slice the wing surface. And to do that, I'm going to move from a volume slice to a surface slice. And what this is basically going to do it's going to slice the surface of the, the zone. So you can see that it's slicing the ground. So I'll just deactivate the ground. We don't care to look at a, a slice on the ground. So here is a slice on the wing. Um, I'll go ahead and change this to filled and put this out of the way for a minute. 
So we have one slice. Uh, you can do one of two things to add slices uh, in TechBot if you want to have multiple slices on the wing. So one thing that you can do is if you hold down the Shift button while using the Slice tool, it will actually add a second slice. So again, if you hold Shift, you can actually add that second slice. Um, right now, it's just showing me the position of the slice, but if I chose to, I could show, rather than looking at the edge, I could look at the pressure on the wing and perhaps make this a little thicker so that you can see it as well. Okay, it looks like good. That shows up. Okay, so we have uh, now two slices on the wing. I'm going to add a series of intermediate slices and um, to have a, a nice robust number, let's go ahead and say select 19 of these. And we can do that here. And I'll go ahead and close this. So if I redraw very quickly, you can see that there are now 19 slices that basically go uh, across the, the wing here. And I'm going to see if I can move this up a little bit and move it by holding Shift. I'll change the other extreme. So I've got a, a relatively nice number of samples along my wing. Now I could turn off the cowling uh, for this example, it doesn't matter. So uh, again, this is the analysis is relatively straightforward. We're going to look at the pressure coefficient on the wing by right-clicking on a slice and extracting. So what that's going to do is create a new zone for each slice or each uh, slice that's on the wing. And uh, because it's surface data, even though these data are quite large, you can see that in fact uh, it only takes a second because it knows not to go out and query the volume. I'll change my page here to 3D volume. And uh, I'm doing that because, in principle, I just want to uh, be able to differentiate between these slices. Now, in TechPlot today, what we've had for a long time is the ability to create frames. So this is a very typical. People would generally uh, create a frame almost as an embedded uh, image, and within that, they would bring in an XY line data. And when I move into XY line mode, what happens is TechBlot says, OK, I'm going to pull the data in here. And uh, one thing you'll notice is that uh, it's asking me, what do you want to do? Do you want to plot just versus the first zone? And the reason it's asking is because for a lot of data, you may not have any uh, line data. You may have primarily volume data. So you may not want to look at an XY line plot of the far field probably not particularly interesting, and also you'd be trying to plot 91 million cells. So we don't want to do that. We do, however, want to look at uh, this line plot for all of the linear zones. So x, in this case, is correct as we're going uh, across the wing, but we're going to look at the pressure. Uh, but we have several options, p total, we could look at uh, velocity magnitude, et cetera. But let's, for this example, just look at pressure. And with a click, you can see that we now have all of the, the data plotted here. Uh, you can see that some of the data, like in this case, uh, we're actually looking at a flap that we're cutting through. Uh, in this case, I'm, I'm thinking this might be the engine or the cowling, although maybe this is. But what I can do now is say, well, I don't want these uh, particular ones here because, in fact, uh, this is going through the cowling and it's just going to make the plot harder to understand. So then if I hit a control F and just get, again, get rid of the ones that don't make a lot of sense, then you can see here are all those cuts, those CP cuts uh, along the wing. So what is different in classic uh, TechBot 360, the version that's on the market today, you would have to basically do this extraction via a macro. And we don't want people to have to write a macro if they don't need to. Uh, <laughs> sorry, someone just uh, Posted a comment, said, wow, that looks cool. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, uh, the idea is that this allows you to basically go through and do the analysis quickly versus trying to write a macro. Not that writing a macro is very difficult, but and we're going to actually go through how to write a macro for this type of analysis on the second example. So this is a simple way to uh, look at cuts on a wing. The next thing I'd like to show you is how one can actually take this information back into, say, PowerPoint. If you select the side of the frame and just hit Control-C for those people who uh, like keyboard shortcuts, that's my preference. You can also select the, the edge of the frame and go to Edit, Copy. 
And what that does is it does two things. It allows me to copy the frame, and so if I'm within text plot and I hit Control V, I can paste a frame. And I have a new tool available to me, which is uh, the frame sidebar. So you can see we have two frames, frame one and frame two. Uh, let's see, I'll grab this one, press Control C. If I hit paste, you'll see I now have a new frame two. And I can move that around so I can set it active, uh, for example. But let's just grab the, the more interesting plot. We'll hit Control C again. If I wanted to paste it in tech plot, I could do so. We'll go back into PowerPoint. We'll see here we're going to generate a new slide. And we'll just highlight here and press paste. And voila, there is our image that was on the, the clipboard. So we actually copy it to the clipboard. We also copy it to, or have access to it within the TechBot application itself. OK. So that's some of the basics. If I wanted to look at pressure on the, um, the body, I can actually just right click and again turn on the contour variable on the body and make that contour pressure. So that's, a, an, again, a very easy way to set pressure. If I wanted to look at, say, uh, the temperature on the wing, I could do that as well. So as soon as I do that, it will load in the temperature. It brings up a, in this case, a legend. Um, it's not all that important for me to have the legend, so I can just hide it with a right click. So we'll turn that off. So this is one of the things that drove us to move to frames, because Here's a great example I have, the, the data that I'm interested in looking at, but it's obscured by the, the bigger frame. And so one thing people have been doing, I've noticed, is they'll actually do a lot of stuff like this, where they'll make one frame larger, and then they'll go in and make a second frame larger, because they're trying to actually go through and look at the pressure coefficients as a function of uh, span-wise location. So, that uh, we wanted to say, well, what's another way to do that? And we came up with the idea of pages. So I'm going to add a page and call this uh, CP, or this is actually pressure. So uh, now that I have this new frame or page, I have my original page, and I'm going to grab one of these frames. And as I said, if I hit Control C, I can walk into this new uh, page and pop that in, and. Uh, make that a little larger. So now I have my, my pressure co my pressure coefficients, in this case is pressure. And uh, it's right next to, if I want to go back to the volume or 3D volume, I could do that as well. So this is kind of a neat thing that we've brought in, because now you know if I go back and I look at the pressure, and maybe instead of pressure, I want to make a new page. And let's just look at temperature on the wing. And so I make a new, and if I pop over here and move into XY line mode, what TechBot's going to do is pull data in from the data set of interest. And while we're back, and instead of looking at pressure this time, we're going to look at temperature. We're going to hit OK. Same kind of thing. Uh, there will be a couple of these that are going to need to be deactivated to make the rest of them more readable. And if I hit a Control F, voila, now you're looking at the temperature profile. Looks like we're coming through an aileron. I'll, I'll deactivate these when we as well. Okay. So again, we've uh, tried to make that analysis easier. So we have pressure now. We have the 3D volume. If I go ahead and add a new one here, I'm going to put in, um, if we wanted to analyze a UAV, maybe we decide to put UAV here. So this 3D volume we're going to put as a transport. Okay. So rather than bringing in that data, I will go ahead and load a data file. In this case, the data file will just be in PLT. It's relatively small. And that example is part of a project that was run in TechBlock Chorus. And we'll just go ahead and add that. We'll open this up. So this is a simple UAV. So we have uh, now a UAV. Maybe we want to flood this by uh, pressure the same kind of thing on the body as well. And uh, we remember we talked about the slice extraction, but this time we're going to do it slightly differently in that we're going to generate a geometry along the path of the wing. And by right-clicking on that geometry now, I can do the same thing. I can extract, say, 200 points 
along that path. And uh, we now have access to that spanwise. If we have loads, we could actually look at the spanwise loads. Um, but in this case, we don't need that. So we're going to pop in. We have a new frame. Again, one could have done this in a page. And uh, we're going to do this for all the linear zones. So we're going to look at, uh, let's see, z as the x-axis, since we're going along the z-axis. And for the y-axis, I guess we'll put a pressure. Say OK. And uh, we'll fit that. It doesn't look like it's changing very much along the path that I chose. So the idea, though, is that you can kind of very quickly access information about uh, of the plot and do the interrogation much more quickly than you could before. And that's, again, really critical when you start to think about, how do I make a good decision about what I'm trying to do? Well, you do that by uh, doing this type of analysis. So, so let's say for this example, we actually have quite a few of these, uh, of these design points that we're trying to interrogate. And we want to be able to bring them in and very quickly look at them and be able to compare the data. This is, uh, again, part and parcel to what people are doing day in, day out. So design engineers spend a lot of their time effectively comparing solutions. So let, let's go ahead and get rid of this, and we'll, we'll go back to the desktop for a moment. Um, okay. So this is uh, the data I'm going to load in. But this time, I want to actually load the data in, and then I'm going to use a macro. And we're going to put that macro right here so that we can do the analysis we want to do. So uh, let's go ahead and load the data, again, to be consistent. So we'll load a data file. And uh, the data file will be in that same directory. It really doesn't matter uh, which example we choose. So let's just look at, say, one of the higher mock numbers, say mock 0.6. And we'll load this in. Now, I want to automate the formation of the plot of interest, because I want that macro to be something that I can uh, put into my quick macro panel to speed up my overall analysis. So what I'm going to do, for those people who haven't written a macro in TechPlot, all you need to do is go to scripting and hit record a macro. Um, this is my working directory. I tend to use TechPlot in a working directory, and I'll show you why here in a second. And uh, we'll, we'll call this um, maybe pressure on wing, OK? Because that's what we want to do. We're going to do that. And we want to compare those. So it tells you that auto redraw is disabled. That's really not important. So I'll move this out of the way for a moment. I'm going to reposition the, uh, the vehicle so that it's in the middle of my workspace. I'm going to pop into slice. And now I want to slice in Z, not in X. So I'll go to Z, uh, look at a surface zone. I want the mesh on. I want that mesh to be uh, the pressure. And I don't need to see the edge. I'll make the, the thickness of the mesh a little thicker so you can see it. And then I'll turn on the slice, grab the tool. I'm going to put a slice on the wing here. I'll hold Shift, put the second slice, so that's the, the extent of where I'm trying to put the data here. OK, so now we have a reasonable number. OK. Oh, I don't want to clip the rear wing, so I will deactivate the rear wing. And if I hit redraw, you can see it's gone. And I'm going to, say, grab this slice, put it about here. I'll go into details as I did in the first example. I will put in, say, 20. Eh, well, let's make it a little simpler. We'll, we'll just put in 5. It really doesn't matter. But you get the idea. All right. I hit close. If I redraw, you'll see that this is the position of those slices. I am going to right click on the slice. And I'm going to extract. Same exercise we did before. Okay, So now we have uh, the, slice, the slices where we want them. We're going to create a frame because we want to have more of an embedded plot look. And we will move that into an XY line mode. It's going to ask me again how I want to do this. I'm going to do for each one of the linear zones. Z is the axis of 
interest, then I will look at pressure. And uh, let's see, I guess Z is not the axis, it would be X. And so and that's not a big deal. So I can go in the mapping style. I'll select all the maps and we'll right click on here and just type in X and we'll bring it up. I'll just put that as X. Okay. Close this. If I hit a control F, it will redraw them and there are my my pressure curves. I will change the axes here and actually most people look at the Y axis in first reverse order. And then I'll hit control F and then it's add let's say here. Let's say this is the plot. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to frame. I want this embedded. I'm going to edit this current frame by removing the border, by removing the background, and we'll just call this on wing. And the reason we're going to do that is uh, you'll see it will pop up over here. So close that. You can see now that I've got pressure on the wing. And if I wanted to, I can edit this one as well. You can actually bring them, if you have them embedded, you can move them back and forth. If I hit a redraw, you'll see that it's now kind of embedded in the work area, which is kind of what we wanted in this case. So that's all I want to do with this particular macro. I'm going to stop recording, and it asks them if I'm sure, I'm going to say yes. Okay, let's go to the directory where we put that macro, and I'm going to show you uh, how you can bring or take advantage of this macro in the Quick Macro panel. So your Quick Macro panel is based on the techplot.mcr file. And so this is the techplot.mcr file. And you can see that right now it only has two macros. The first one is load an add-on, uh, which basically prompts for a text string and then uses the load add-on command. In this case, uh, we're going to just copy one of these and we're going to paste it here. And we'll call this uh, pressure on wing. Uh, and we're going to see here, you can uh, get a sense of what it's doing. It's saying include macro. Basically, that's to load the macro information. We're going to just change to the pressure on the wing macro. So I'll copy that and uh, replace the extended macro here. And uh, paste that in. All right, we'll save this, and I'm going to fire up another window. And you can see now this is Tefal 360EX. Over on the sidebar, you see that there's now pressure on the wing. So we've added that macro. Let's go ahead and load a data file. That data file, uh, this is the data file we looked at first. Let's look at one with a low mock number. We'll open that data. And if I want to play this macro, I can either click on it and hit play, uh, but we've heard from a lot of our beta testers that they prefer just to double click. And voila. So it goes through, it does the analysis, and it makes the curve. So we're going to say, wow, that's cool. Let's put this as mock 0.27. We're going to add a new page. And we're going to load a data file. In this case, let's add one from, say, the mock 0.1 at a different alpha. So we'll load that data in. Same kind of thing. I'll just double click. I'm going to make my, my set of plots. OK. And uh, this will call this mock uh, 0 0.1. And then I'm going to add one more page. Um, we'll actually hope this will be mock 0 0.1. And if I'll load the data file, the data file in this case will be from one of the 0.6 mocks. There we go. Add that to the list. Go ahead and open that up. Same kind of thing. We can pressure on wing, and voila. That's done. I'm actually going to hide this particular example. OK. So now I can quickly go look at each of the models and get a sense of what the CP curves will look like. Now what I want to do is I'm going to make one additional page. And this page is going to be a comparison. And how I'm going to compare is I'll go over to mock uh, 0.27 and I'll copy that frame. And I'm going to go into the compare and I'll paste it in. So um, I'll double click here. I'm going to show the border just so that it's easier to maneuver. But I'm going to show you why that doesn't matter at all. 
we'll go ahead and delete this uh, frame. And I'm going to turn on the background. OK. Same kind of thing. Let's go over and grab the point one. And uh, let's see. There it is. I'll copy that. We're going to go into compare. I'll paste that one in as well. And under frame, I will edit the current frame. And I'm going to show border and background. And the last one we'll do is grab uh, the mock point six. Again, I'll select the frame, copy it, go to compare and paste that right in, and uh, show border and background. OK, so now we have all those frames. I'll just use the tile frame where I'll give it a vertical preference. And now here are the, the different, different curves. So for each one, um, I can even go in here and type, so I guess this was mock. 0.1. Um, I could also put in dynamic text and maybe use a data file uh, name. And this would be mock uh, 0 0.27. And the last one was uh, mock 0 6. Uh, so what we've done now, basically, excuse me, is we've started by writing this nice macro using the quick macro panel, I could very quickly go through and analyze uh, a number of different configurations and compare them. So uh, right now, that's basically the extent. What we're moving towards is to allow you to link style across pages. We haven't done that yet, but it's, it's certainly uh, the direction we're going. All right, I want to quickly pop back into um, to the PowerPoint presentation for a moment. And then we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to start to answer some questions. So I've kind of given you a basic tutorial on the basics of 360. Uh, I've shown you how you can work with collections. And the data uh, can be heterogeneous. We looked at the transport airplane. We looked at the UAV. Showed you how you can compare results using pages. Um, so we actually leverage pages quite a few times uh, to compare results. I showed you how to record macros and leverage those macros. And this is basically how one can build a report within 360. So at this point, I want to summarize uh, quickly. And then we'll kind of open it up to questions. So, so again, TechBall 360EX, our primary goal for this release has been, well, let's just go back to this slide very quickly. And then we'll go to the last slide. OK, cool. There you go. So our goal is, was to add features that made it easier to go through basic workflow. So I showed you a little bit about the Sizzle technology. Uh, the easiest way to kind of summarize what we're doing with Sizzle would be to show you the Chorus project, again, where we look at relatively large data sets. And you can see that on some of these, we're seeing speed ups in the 95 to 100%. Uh, we looked at two different layouts. That's why you're seeing two points here. So with Sizzle data, you can see very nice speed ups and low memory utilization with large data files. And the break even point, as near as we can tell, seems to be about anything over 40 million. The, the performance improvements are pretty significant, um, as I showed you in the the image around memory utilization, uh, it's even more significant. Uh, you saw the new UI about the sidebars. The pages, I think, is a, what I've seen from the people who've been on the beta community. The pages look like perhaps one of the most interesting new areas of functionality within the application. Uh, I showed you some of the context menu and the macro panel in general. Uh, I'm going to show you one last thing on the arbitrary slice, and then we'll just open it up to questions. So. Uh, go over here. So the one thing I didn't show you, uh, perhaps, is that if you have a slice uh, and you go into the volume, so we'll go to an arbitrary slice of the volume zone. And I'll, I'll just flip this so you can see it. So this is the origin. I can move the origin on the slice. And let's go to the slice. Uh, move this particular. We've got a frame overlap issue. There we go. That should make that go away. OK, so I can move 
No, no, no. There we go. All right. If one grabs the origin, you, you can actually move the origin through the domain. Uh, you can also change the orientation of the slicing just by grabbing um, one of the either the arrow or the tail and kind of changing the orientation. You can move the location of the normal in the domain just by grabbing the cylinder. And you can move the origin to an area of interest. And as you zoom in here, uh, you can quickly kind of get a sense of how you might leverage that technology. So, OK. So at this point, let me go quickly back in. So I showed you some of this technology. Again, we see huge speed ups for large data and a very nice memory utilization. So I'd like to, again, those people who sat in today, if you're interested in taking 360EX for a test drive prior to the release, which should be in the next week, if we're lucky, it might even be as early as early next week, uh, please hop on over to be a beta tester. And uh, you can sign up. And I'll put you on the list. And we'll get you access to a uh, release candidate. And you can take it for a test drive. So I'm going to open it up to questions. We have about 10 minutes or so for questions, or maybe a little less. So feel free. Again, if you want to ask a question, all you have to do is pop over to the Questions tab. If you log on there, you can just type in a question. It will show up here on my side. And I'll go ahead and answer uh, any questions you might have. So uh, let me go ahead and open it up to questions. OK. Um, so it looks like the, the first question is about data compatibility with EX. And uh, interestingly enough, OK, so uh, someone's asking about NetCDF, uh, which is a format that we don't currently support. However, uh, we do have an alpha version of a NetCDF data loader. And uh, that data loader, I think at this point, is only for the ROMs format. But uh, so if you're using a more general NetCDF, File format, you know, we'd love to hear about it. So you know, send it our way. Um, let's see. We have uh, another question about performance. Uh, okay, I, my data is in CGNS, and uh, I use it as a restart file. I probably can't convert files. Okay, so you're asking about will I see a benefit? Um, that's a great question. I'll go back to this plot for a moment and. Um, let's go ahead and just look at the benefit you'd see over the 2013 R1. And I'll hit Control R. So the red line is the baseline. Basically, this is what the performance you would see today on your, uh, your CGNS data. What you're seeing in the orange line, is that orange? I guess it's orange. These data are the speed ups relative to just the current version of 360 with general data. And you can see that once you get into the 40 million cell range, you do see some nice speed ups. And even uh, with very small data, it's about three times faster. So uh, again, you, if you're using the, the new sizzle format, the new sizzle technology, you're going to see huge improvements. But you'll see improvements even if your data are small. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. So if you have a question, please uh, feel free to ask it. Um, this will be recorded and archived on the website. So if you do have a question and you didn't get a chance to put or type it out here, that's fine too. We can uh, go ahead and answer these off. So let's see. OK. Uh, last question was about the availability of 360EX uh, for academics. And OK, so academics currently have access to all of our products. So if you're an academic, you're going to I'll get this as well. I think we have time for one additional question. Uh, I want to know: Is there? Okay, I want to know about the limit to recording macros. That's a um, boy. You may want to give me a little more detail on that. Uh, let's see. Oh, initialize. Okay, that's pretty small. Oh, yeah. So I'm not sure if you mean limit macros or. Uh, what about the initialization to record macros? Oh, limitations, maybe, is what you're asking. Um, 
See, most things are recordable. That is to say that there are uh, macro commands for almost everything you would do on screen. And if you're ever curious, so for example, if you go to scripting and record a macro, and I'm going to make this something I delete quickly. So. OK, so here's a delete me macro. All right, I'm, I'll put a graphics off. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to add a page. OK. And uh, then I'm going to say move into 3D Cartesian mode and hit a redraw and stop recording. OK, so not a lot of commands in this macro. If I go back to the working directory here, here's the delete me macro. And so a couple of things you can see, OK, it says page name is on click, OK, page control create. And then it says uh, pick mode, this is totally immaterial. You could move so this, these picks are actual clicks on screen. You just don't need them. Uh, put the plot type into Cartesian 3D. So th that's a, so almost everything that I did on screen, actually, I think in this case, everything was recorded. So good question. We have time for one more question. OK, it doesn't look like uh, there's any additional questions. So uh, thank you again for joining me this morning, or an afternoon in this case. Um, very excited to announce that we'll be releasing 360EX probably in the next week. Um, we do have a release candidate that's out to the beta community. So if you're part of the beta community, we have a new one being posted today. Hopefully, that'll be the final one. Um, look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Our next webinar will be coming up probably in early July. And we will be working with a company, uh, Carolet Technologies. And Carolet will be looking at Immersed Boundary uh, CFD code. Their, their code is actually cool if you happen to be looking at a complex geometry. It uh, cuts mesh generation down quite a bit. And we'll be going through a couple of examples of a Renault uh, race car and trying to optimize overall performance. So look forward to this, some emails on that coming up here soon. Thank you again for joining me. And uh,